I can vouch for that. It's not IQ points being good, it's really an attitude of how you look at, look at the world. You shameless cloner, want to track portfolios of famous value investors like Warren Buffett, see their buys and sells, current and historical holdings? Just visit valueinvesting.guru. It is valueinvesting.guru, link in the description. Well, he's worth $40 billion himself, so, <laughs> you know, I don't know who he's giving it back to. Uh, you know, I guess he'd rather run it than somebody else. Uh, sort of a, it's a partnership that he has with his shareholders, and he's running their money along with his. And so I don't think he, you know, um, he does have a benefit in, in size right now, for instance, he doesn't really look for stocks all that much, although if he finds a large cap stock that's cheap, he'll still buy it, but he's really looking to swallow whole companies now, which is at the stage he's at, given the amount of money that he has to run. Um, and so I don't, I don't think that's a realistic opportunity for him, given the fact that he, he's owned so much of the company. He did say he's going to consider returning cash to shareholders if he can't find something relevant. Right. Well, right. It, it, it really depends. Uh, you know, a lot of his money is run through insurance companies. And so if he can have, uh, if he can create, in other words, if, if he can write insurance and break even, okay, in other words, his loss ratio is 100 or less, then his borrowing costs are next to nothing. And so his cost of capital is very low because he, he basically has all these insurance businesses. And so his hurdle rate might not have to be 15%. In other words, because of sort of the leverage of using the insurance companies, even if he takes investments that are earning 10 or 12%, he's adding a huge amount of incremental value to the equity stake in, in the firm if he can put it to work at that level. And I would guess that he's not returning any money any time soon, I think. Uh, I think that he, he'll always find something uh, to put it to work in to beat his cost of capital, which I think varies from zero to three or four percent. So I think, you know, I don't, I don't see that happening, but you, you can give me a call if it happens. Yes, Allison. Well, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the Walmart story, although I know they have a lot of international opportunities where they're expanding. I think they can still expand here. Um, and so I think, you know, when I, when I briefly looked at their uh, growth opportunities for the next, you know, five years, I think they had enough. Uh, if you have a, if you use a dividend discount model, uh, it doesn't take, the, you know, when Rich Pizzino was here, there are almost no companies that grow 15 or 20 percent a year ad infinitum. You know, there are very few that can do it over a 10-year period. Um, and you don't really need that growth anyway, because any, if you throw it into any dividend discount model and say, you know, in perpetuity we're going to grow 10 percent a year, uh, you get some ridiculously high P.E. ratios that, that uh, are justified. And you know, even growing over a long period of time at 5%, you, you can have a pretty high valuation. Uh, you can justify a pretty high valuation. Right, I mean, there's natural growth in the economy. Let's say GNP grows 2 or 3% a year. Throw on some inflation, you have some growth there, and then if they can grow incrementally 2 or 3%, you're, you're getting up to decent size growth rates. So, yes. It's not the same as any of these things that Charlie 479 wrote up. Uh, and that's why I was saying the large caps might, um, well, it's an important concept because 
if you say, listen, I can see over the next five years uh, Walmart growing its value at 15 percent, you know, and then goes to a slower level, you know, a lower level, uh, if people perceive that and there are limited places to put your money when you can you'd only invest in a 10-year bond at four and change percent or even if we use our hurdle rate which is six percent uh, you know people may discount that back and say I'll take an eight percent return and, and you may get a big chunk of this this year you may you may earn 30 or 40 percent on your money if you're following this if you're saying if if a stock will go from 10 to 20 in five years right which is about uh, roughly a, a 15 percent, 14 percent annualized return, okay, and you're, competi you're, you're competing with six percent annual returns, or s and you and someone figures out that they think it is going to be worth 20 in a few years. You the stock may move to 13. In other words, in the first year, they may say, "Look, 13 to 20 in four years is still a good rate of return, better than I can get elsewhere." Okay, so a year from paying 10. Even though you think it's going to grow 15%, you in your first year of holding, you made 30%. Because the market now agrees with you that, hey, this is going to be worth 20 in five years. Remember we discussed this? And so therefore, I, I can front load a lot of my profits in the first year or two as soon as people realize what I realize. So this is a way that you figure out that it can only you know, increase in value 15% a year or 14% a year, which is really what this is, yet you can still make 30% or you know, 40% over two years, or a year and a half, or something like that, because people realize what you saw, even though the growth rate is significantly lower in, in increase in value. So it depends what discount you're getting. It's important to keep in mind when you're making your projections that it, whether you have a catalyst that you think everyone will see uh, what you see now. The catalyst may be a year from now, even though your valuation work is done three or five years out. So if it's discounted back, you, you can make that money. Um, you don't sometimes need a catalyst. Just say, listen, they're going to earn that money. The catalyst is, they came through with the earnings that I expected. Uh, and, and you can get, get, make the money that way. You shameless cloner, want to track portfolios of famous value investors like Warren Buffett? See their buys and sells, current and historical holdings? Just visit valueinvesting.guru. It is valueinvesting.guru. Link in the description. Adam? Uh, back in the day before your uh, circle of confidence was so expansive, um, you know, what are the steps that you would take to really learn an industry? Uh... Well, if you're asking Warren Buffett as opposed to me, uh, I would. Uh, uh, Warren Buffett does have uh, very significant circles of competence in, you know, financial stocks, in, uh, in, in all kinds of businesses that he can really understand uh, over time, uh, and I think the way you you get that is really by researching them under, you know picking businesses that are simple that you can understand. He, he's kept away from technology uh, specifically because he doesn't understand where it's going. He doesn't understand what's it going to look like in five years. Intuitively, he doesn't get that. Now, if you listen to Bill Miller, has anyone heard him speak? Around here? So it's a great opportunity to hear Bill Miller. Bill, Miller's, Bill Miller said is sort of, I'm going to look at technology because most because of what Buffett has said. Uh, most value investors don't even look at technology stocks, so I'm going to apply value discipline to technology, try to understand as much as I can, and you know, there's a great opportunity there. So it's not Buffett saying value investors don't buy technology, it's that that's just not where he feels comfortable uh, projecting the future. And, and Bill Miller takes the other approach saying, look, a lot of, most value investors won't even look in these areas, and I'm going to try to buy cheap technology stocks. The only way I personally, Joel, would look at technology stocks in general is when we have cash situations where you're buying the technology almost, almost for free and there's not a big burn rate and things of that nature. Um, if there's a technology I think I can understand over long periods of time, perhaps, um, but I haven't found that one yet. So, yeah, Joe. So is the real issue with circle of competence not the complexity of the business, but the complexity of trying to figure out where that business will be in X number of years? 
Well, if you understand the business, you can understand that you can't understand where it's going in five years. There's so many different things, right? You can understand that there's no one who knows, right? So that's one thing. And if there's no one who knows, you have no business investing in it. Uh, so just understanding the business is one, is only one component. You can understand the business, and, and one of the practicalities of the business would be, you know, no one really can predict. It's, it's sort of, over a short period of time, I, ca I can't tell you where the, you know, I could say, gee, I'm finding a lot of cheap stocks out there, but I really can't tell you where the market's going to be in a year. <coughs> or if I did, I'd be being silly. Uh, because even if it's cheap now, it can get a lot cheaper over the next year. I can't really tell you where it's going to go. And if you don't know long term where uh, a business is going, then you really have no basis to invest. I mean, if, if you're buying something at even five times earnings, but you don't know where earnings are going, you know, they could have or, or go, you know, be down 75% uh, over five years, then you have no basis on which to invest uh, other than looking at hard assets and things of that nature. You know, what I was talking about is a technology company which I know nothing about, yet I think management, management's incentive is not to dissipate the cash they have on the balance sheet. It's selling at $5, it's got $5 in cash, and it's got a business that's not burning money that may turn into something. You know, it's almost like a free option I might look at it, or inexpensive option. Um, and so there's different ways to approach it. So there are ways to, to, to make investments. There is a price that you might be interested in in almost anything, uh, even if there is uncertainty, as long as the uncertainty isn't, well, it's, it's you're going to have huge negative returns over a period of time. So it can be done. Uh, it's not usually what I look for. It's, it's usually simple businesses that I understand. Steve. Um, uh, I can't. I can't answer for Buffett other than I think that he is an incredible intellect who will still, you know, will have a lot of horses running up there more than we do, uh, and will not be deterred by more competition looking for the things that that he's doing. I, I don't think he's particularly worried about that. I mean, there are certain principles um, of that he said. He said it's really not IQ points, and I, I can vouch for that. It's not IQ points being good. It's really an attitude of how you look at, uh, look at the world. 